Welcome to Faith and Science. I'm Dr. John Ashton. I know often uh, when you look at uh, the um, different discussions uh, on the evidence for creation versus uh, evolution, uh, sometimes a number of articles are published by chemists and um, people, uh, you know, some of the detractors try to say, well, you know, they're not biologists, they're not really qualified to talk in the area of uh, evolution. But evolution, the claimed evolution is underpinned by biochemistry or by chemistry, by chemical reactions themselves. And in actual fact, chemists have very good insight into, uh, particularly organic chemists, um, into the requirements that would be necessary for evolution to occur by chance in nature. And the evidence is just overwhelming. Everywhere we look um, in nature at the chemical reactions, it all points to a super intelligent creator designer. Um, the evidence is overwhelming everywhere. And it, it just really frustrates me that this isn't being pointed out to students. And the, the, some of the claims that are being made to try and explain, you know, uh, ev- evolution that, um, you know, that um, under certain environmental conditions, you know, fish somehow uh, uh, developed uh, the different structures to uh, become an amphibian and, and so forth. And, you know, the claims for the um, uh, for these sort of changes in the fossil record. But what, what the people making these assertions seem to not understand is the massive amount of biochemistry changes that are required. And these involve reactions, we often, you know, and, and specific compounds uh, that are required to, um, you know, change physical structures and and uh, make new physical structures work and so forth, let alone the programming required, changes required in the, the DNA itself to encode for all this new information blindly by random chance. And I'd like to, you know, illustrate this an article that um, I read recently um, by a, uh, a, a synthetic chemist, uh, Dr. Glenn we- Phillips. Um, Dr. Phillips um, yeah, uh, uh, earned his uh, PhD in synthetic organic chemistry from Michigan State University. And um, he's uh, written a couple of books uh, on uh, or, uh, organic chemistry. Um, and uh, he actually uh, served as a, a, a professor of chemistry at the University of South Alabama. And um, he gives um, an illustration um, in this book that I've referred to a few times, Design and Catastrophe, 51 Scientists Explore Evidence in Nature, which was published by Andrews University Press in 2021. And he... he has a um, a chapter in there um, uh, on cholesterol, the wonder of biosynthesis. Now, probably you know most of us have heard of of cholesterol um, in many Western uh, countries. Uh, people have medical checks and their cholesterol levels are measured, and we're told to you know get our cholesterol level down to a um, a certain level if it's high um, in order to reduce the risk of uh, heart disease and and so forth, heart and artery uh, disease. But cholesterol is a, is a very important material in mammals, very, very important material. And it, it was uh, discovered, you know, 200, nearly 250 years ago, um, back in 1769, Francis uh, Pelletier uh, de La Salle uh, uh, isolated it from gallstones. And since that time, it's actually attracted a lot of attention. Um, Way back in uh, 1932, the first total synthesis was attempted uh, by, by chemists. Now, you know, by the 1930s, of course, we 
had a lot of chemistry we were building, you know, high energy explosives. Um, and um, there was um, a massive expansion of uh, organic chemistry was occurring uh, and our understanding and synthetic chemistry was occurring in the 1930s. And uh, so by 1949, uh, after the war, and of course there were massive advances in, in chemistry made during that time as well, uh, during the war period, uh, two very famous groups were competing to be the first to synthesize cholesterol. So here we have this compound that is found in our bodies, in nature, and um, here we have teams of scientists competing to try and figure out how to make it. All right? Now, again, if we look at the evolutionary scenario, um, we, you know, this occurred in nature or by blind random chance. Um, and I think this article, as Dr. Phillips points out, really explains beautifully how far removed blind random chance can be to produce cholesterol. And remember, the way it's got to be produced is you've got to have changes, random mutations in a code, in a DNA code made up of four chemicals uh, that encode this information that we abbreviate A, C, T and G. So it was interesting, it wasn't until 1951 that the first synthetic route was published by Robinson and Cornforth. Um, and then the following year, another synthesis was published by Woodford and Sondheimer. Uh, since then, at least three other synthetic routes have been reported with the final product being either a racemic mixture, that's a 50-50 mixture of the natural product and its mirror image of the natural product. Um, so there's all these attempts. Now, one of the interesting things is that none of those attempts were able to produce the pure compound. They could produce a 50-50 mixture um, but that was the best that they could, could do. Or they can produce the mirror image, but they couldn't produce the pure compound. So here we have top scientists in the world working together to try and synthesise this important biochemical um, that's important in life, uh, for, uh, for, uh, particularly for mammals, and um, they haven't been able to synthesise the pure compound. And it's interesting, he says, each of the chemical routes to synthesis started with a naturally occurring compound that could be either extracted from natural sources or bought from a chemical company that synthesised the starting material from even simpler natural products. They, in order to synthesise cholesterol, uh, they had to make a whole lot of different intermediates, they had to make various catalysts, they had to make a whole lot of other support reagents, and substrates, uh, all these uh, chemicals had to be purchased or prepared. And the shortest reported route to the mirror image cholesterol, not the naturally occurring compound, consisted of 16 steps. So there were 16 separate chemical reactions that had to be set up and the chemists had to do and in the end, they got, when they started with the um, uh, compound um, S-citronellol, um, they ended up with a 2% yield. So only 2% of the theoretical yield that they should have got were they able to achieve. Um, the synthesis of pure naturally occurring synthesis took many more steps. So eventually they did um, uh, achieve the synthesis of the pure material and the yield was minuscule. And so they sort of, uh, you know, worked on it uh, for years to um, achieve that um, synthesis eventually getting through to the pure material. Now, if anyone is uh, interested in looking up um, 
The reference um, was uh, by Cardwell, Cornforth, Holterman and Robinson. Uh, it was a paper titled Total Synthesis of Androgenic Hormones and it was published in Chemistry and Industry um, uh, in 1951. Uh, volume 101, pages 389 to 390. Um, uh, the, uh, another paper that might be a little bit easier for people to look up uh, because it was um, uh, published in the Journal of the American Chemical Society in 1952, volume 74, pages 4223 to 4251, and that's by... Uh, Woodward and uh, co-authors. Um, so we can see that um, uh, it took quite um, a team to synthesise um, that, um, uh, just to synthesise cholesterol, massive effort. Now, in mammals, cholesterol is synthesised mainly in the liver or but also in the adrenal glands and the intestines and also in the gonads. Um, but its entire carbon backbone is made from one molecule, um, an acetyl group. And um, the first stage of the biological synthesize, uh, synthesis utilises um, three of those acetyl groups um, and involves um, a coenzyme. Uh, which is then used to produce uh, uh, mevalonate, uh, which is a six-carbon uh, intermediate. And then the next step involves adding three phosphates to it and um, to the two hydroxyl groups using another special enzyme, kinase, um, and also adding three uh, ATP, um, adenosine triphosphates to it. Now, it's interesting that in the synthesis that occurs you know, in mammals, naturally in nature, the kinase enzyme just uh, adds a phosphate group and then later um, adds um, mos uh, more phosphate groups and then removes some carbon dioxide. So it's quite a tricky chemical reaction series goes on there. Um, this produces uh, a product isopentyl pyrophosphate um, and then some of that is stored in that form while a larger portion is uh, converted to another chemical, uh, dimethyl thalli thalyl pyrophosphate. Um, and uh, this uses a, a separate isomerization process. Um, and in this uh, process, one of the external double bond bonds is moved um, uh, to inside the, the, the ring. So the, the chemical synthesis um, goes on involving you know, a whole lot of more steps that are involved in the, um, in the um, synthesis of, of cholesterol. For example, another phanosyl pyrophosphate is uh, produced um, and added to one that was uh, produced um, earlier um, in the synthesis, and that makes squalene with 30 carbons. Now, squalene has all the carbons needed to make cholesterol, uh, but the actual famous four-ring structure of that uh, cholesterol has, hasn't been formed. And so to achieve this, one of two double bonds at the end of the squalene chain out of a possible six choices um, is oxidised with oxygen and uh, another chemical called uh, nicotinamide um, adene uh, dinucleotide phosphate and it makes squalene oxide. Now, that particular oxide is then cleaved chemically um, in a, a quite a, an impressive cascade reaction in which all the internal double bonds of squalene react in sequence to form the steroid ring system. So it's amazing chemistry that has taken place. Now, 
Uh, Lanosterol is the next major intermediate. It's formed via a number of hydride and methyl group shifts and an elimination of hydrogen to produce uh, the double bond. And it takes another 19 steps. After all these steps in the body, it takes another 19 chemical reaction steps to produce cholesterol. These steps include the removal of three of the eight methyl groups present in the lanosterol um, by using uh, demethylation, plus the addition and removal of double bonds. So this is an amazing series of complex chemical reactions that are extremely difficult to do in the laboratory, let alone occur by chance in nature. And when you think about it, all these chemicals there and their chemical reactions are programmed in the DNA to take place with the required enzymes and other uh, systems making the other chemicals that are involved in the reactions and this sort of thing. You know, this is, um, it's absolutely huge. And of course, cholesterol is very important because it it uh, is used to make vitamin D, sunlight, um, uh, the reaction of sunlight and cholesterol makes vitamin D. Uh, it's important in making important fatty acids that are important for our biochemistry in our body and, and other steroids. But, you know, it's quite fascinating, and this is one of the factors that points to a design feature. We need to remember, too, that uh, cholesterol, because of its nature, um, has eight what we call chiral centres, which means that based on its structure, there are a possible 256, so that's... um, two to the power eight uh, compounds that could be synthesised with the same chemical formula but a slightly different structure. Now, I'll just explain that again. So uh, if we if we go back to a, a simpler explanation perhaps, if you take your left hand and hold it up to the mirror, what you see in the mirror is your right hand. Um, In other words, your right hand is the mirror image of your left hand. Um, So, you know, you have four fingers and a thumb on both hands, but you can't put a right hand into a left-handed glove. It just doesn't fit. It has, even though it's still four fingers and one thumb, the arrangement is such that its its three-dimensional structure is slightly different. And it's the same with cholesterol. Cholesterol, because of its structure, can have 256 different mirror image forms. And this is because there are eight carbon atoms that have these um, four different bonds that allow for the different mirror image arrangements. So that means that, as I said, there's a possible 256 structures, but it's interesting, only one is produced in the body. And that's the one that is essential and works for the chemical reactions. So again, uh, this is just powerful evidence against the claim that random mutations can, you know, produce the desired effect because the structure that's required is one of 256 possible structures and that's the one that is produced and that's the one that works. Um, It's interesting when they synthesise, you know, the mirror image of cholesterol and this sort of thing, it doesn't have the same biochemical properties. It doesn't work the same. And as I think I've mentioned before when I've talked about this too, often say you have a a left-handed form is the one that the body is utilising, then often the right-handed form is poisonous and vice versa. Um, And so, um, you know, a, a number of venoms, animal venoms, are simply the opposite optical isomer of the natural compound that's required for metabolism in the body, but the toxin is the mirror image compound. 
So when you think about um, the um, the specificity, how specified this um, uh, this whole series of biochemical reactions is, and it's interesting that the chemistry in the body is uh, designed, there's overwhelming evidence that's designed to determine how each isoprene unit should be stored and assembled, as well as how to differentiate between six double bonds in squalene and the eight methyl groups in the lanosterol. The enzyme selectivity that is used, the, you know, the fact and specificity is astounding um, so in other words, the enzymes that control these reactions are so specific. And remember, they have to be synthesised. Not only has cholesterol got to be synthesised, but these enzyme compounds have to be synthesised. And we have to have the code, the genetic code, the DNA code, to construct those proteins and make those enzymes. And the claim that evolutionists had that these structures arose by blind chance, and we could see the interconnectivity of the of the chemistry of this. And this, you have the enzymes, so specific enzymes. Cholesterol isn't going to form. If then cholesterol doesn't form, then the whole biochemical chains are going to fail, and the mammal isn't going to survive. And so, and we wouldn't survive. And so. We can see this is just one aspect of amazing interconnected biochemistry, and it's not one or two steps. We see there are a whole, there are a whole, a huge number of steps are involved in the natural synthesis, a huge number of steps. Yeah, you know, once we got to lanosterol, it took another nineteen chemical steps to make cholesterol. Cholesterol is, you know, we, we know where cholesterol is made. It's made in the liver, adrenal glands, intestines, and the gonads. And we know what it's made from. It's from the manipulation of one molecule, an acetyl group, and it's made through a complex series of steps, extremely complex series of steps. But as the author of this article, Dr. Phillips, uh, um, points out, two questions remain unanswered at this point. When was cholesterol first made and by whom? If the scientific community considered it appropriate to honour with Nobel Prizes the first synthetic feats of Sir Robert Robinson, John Cornforth and Robert B. Woodward, a truly scientific mind must ask the same question about nature. Who created these synthetic pathways? And when you consider this, it's just one of an uncounted number of compounds necessary for life. And it's interesting, um, Dr. Phillips proposes that the real prize belongs to the author of life and nature. And of course, that's the creator God, the creator God that we worship. You know, um, as we, you know, I just consider the world news around at the moment and uh, the, um, you know, as people are arguing and debating over different uh, things and we can see there's all this, you know, relativism is um, just being, you know, propagated. Oh, what's true for, for me? You know, this is true for me and so forth. This whole idea that there's no absolute truth the absolute truth of a, of a creator designer is just everywhere in nature. When we consider the biochemical steps required in just you know, compounds like cholesterol that we take for granted, we go to the doctor and we get our cholesterol level measured and, and, and so forth, if we just forget the amount of specific designed biochemistry that underpins and as um, you know the author Dr. Phillips pointed out we just the number of different specific biochemical reactions that are required to maintain living systems whether they be plants algae bacteria mammals insects you know fish um, creepy crawlies all these things that 
They're full of specific compounds that chemical compounds that are required for life, let alone, you know, the complex reproductive systems and, and so forth. We can see the evidence for a supernatural creator is there. And if that creator can create these amazing systems, including our brain, and as I've said before, our thoughts are non-material, that non-material creator, which is outside space and time, because he created the universe, he created matter, he spoke, as the Bible talks about, he spoke reality into existence. He can communicate with our minds. And he has, the Bible says that that creator wants to have a relationship with us and had spoken to people in the past, audibly spoke to people, sent angels that talked to people, beings that, again, were able to travel without the limitations of space and time as we know it to people. And, the you know, the accounts of these are enormous. And, you know, studies have been done. Um, there was a, there's a group at Oxford... Um, years ago that was studying, you know, made a study of, uh, of reactions, of, of, of encounters rather, spiritual encounters of, of people, of answers to prayer, um, of seeing angels and this sort of thing. The evidence is overwhelming there and the evidence is overwhelming that God came as Jesus Christ and lived among us to show the creator God manifested himself as a human to live among us and to teach us. And some people think, well, why there? And, you know, why at that particular time? But as I've read the Bible and looked at history, it just so much makes sense. And the way God did it makes sense because it leaves us, us to our, leaves everything up to our choice. Do we want to choose to be in God's kingdom? Do we want to choose to be in a kingdom that has the principles that Jesus taught? That's the bottom line, really. And if we do, God offers that if we choose to believe that Jesus was God and that God raised him from the dead and that we choose him as Lord and our Saviour and choose to obey his commandments, which are essentially to love one another, um, we will be saved. Because this world is going to end. God's going to bring an end to it. The Bible says that clearly. There's going to be a judgment. So we have that wonderful hope that the Bible gives us. Um, and that message, of course, is in the Bible. And I encourage everyone listening to buy a Bible, to get a Bible and to read. If you have one and haven't read it for a while, start reading it, particularly the New Testament and particularly perhaps the book of John in the New Testament. You've been listening to Faith and Science. And remember, if you want to re-listen to this program, just Google 3ABN Australia or one word, dot org. .au and click on the listen button. I'm Dr. John Ashton. Have a great day. You've been listening to a production of 3ABN Australia Radio. 